there we go. All right, so I just want to start by saying thank you to all of you who are joining us for the Food as Healing and Prevention Sharing Indigenous Success Stories webinar. Um, I am Amber Cardinal. I work at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, and I used to be a project coordinator that worked on our Healthy Native Foods Initiative, but I have since transitioned out of that role. And so I want to quickly introduce um, to Kayla Lightfield because she is taking over that project. And for those of you who are in the healthy, uh, a part of the Healthy Native Foods Network, you will be hearing from her from now on. So I'm just gonna let her say hi. Hi everyone. <laughs> Okay, and then um, this is a Healthy Native Foods webinar, but we have invited people from the Southwest, um, the East and West Coast actually. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction of who ACAF is in case there are people on who have never heard of us. So the American Indian Cancer <laughs> is a nonprofit that was established in 2009 and became operational in 2011. And our mission is to eliminate cancer burdens on American Indian and Alaska Native people through improved access to prevention, early detection, treatment, and survivor support. So we recognize where we have been and how history has complicated our ability to thrive. At ACAP, we believe in using our own ways to find solutions. And we know that the wisdom lies within each community, which is why we, I, um, always strive to authentically partner to move the needle on these disparities. In order to thrive, we have to come back to our traditional ways. We're not looking to programs to fix us. Our strongest assets are our spirituality, our healing powers, culture, and family systems. So as I said, we have a few food initiatives as, at ACAF. Uh, we like to utilize our food work um, from a standpoint of prevention. So we work to promote the importance of traditional food and healthy eating for cancer, as well as other chronic disease prevention. Um, some of the things that we do is develop culturally tailored resources. And I'll share some of those quickly with you later. Um, and we, one of our really big roles is to foster networking and story sharing among our food champions, because we know we have a ton of great food efforts happening across Indian country. But what we find a lot of times is that um, either people don't know about each other or they're not connected with each other. So we, we work really hard to try to foster those connections so that we can learn from each other. Um, another thing that we do is we assist in coalition building and healthy food policy creation to uh, shift the food culture at individual organizations as well as for a whole tribe. So why focus on food? You can see here from this pie graph that uh, health behaviors affect up to 30% of, of our health, which is inclusive of what we're eating. So this diagram shows a few health behaviors that play a large role in multiple chronic diseases. Each behavior alone has the ability to increase an individual's risk of cancer, and that risk can be further compounded with other chronic diseases such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease, which you can see here. You can see that nutrition is central to it all, and it is a risk factor for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. We have the ability to prevent these diseases with good nutrition, as well as mitigate and even reverse the effects of these diseases. So food truly is medicine, and this is not news to most of us. So not everyone um, consumes alcohol, and not everyone works out, but everyone has to eat. So nutrition is an area where we have the potential to greatly impact the health of a population. Here's a couple statistics that are not the best statistics. Uh, um, up to 81% of American Indians are obese and up to 15% of American Indians suffer from type two diabetes, which is more than double the rate of non-Hispanic whites. We know that this is not all due to individual choice. Forced removal, relocation, and other factors have contributed to the disrupted foodways and declining health for many of our American Indians and Alaska Natives. We know that prior to colonization, our populations had deep relationships with food that cultivated healthy and thriving communities that were so healthy that diseases like cancer didn't even exist. And that's not to say that there are not communities that still have these deep 
deep, deep connections. It's just that we know a lot of them have been disrupted. So that also means that we have the knowledge within our communities to get back to our roots. Aside from, and just as important as the physical aspect of reconnecting with food is the mental, emotional, and spiritual health component. Today, we're going to hear from two people who have been working hard to reclaim and revitalize those relationships with food. So our objectives of our um, webinar today are to share the successes and challenges of Native food initiatives, and then after that to share some uh, a funding opportunity and then a couple of our resources. So first up, we'll have Diane Wilson. She is the co executive co-director of Dream of Wild Health, which is a nonprofit farm in Hugo, Minnesota that reconnects Native people with indigenous foods and medicines. She is the author of two award-winning books that focus on issues of assimilation, historical trauma, and cultural recovery. They are The Spirit Card, Journey to a Dakota Past, and Beloved Child, A Dakota Way of Life, uh, A Dakota Way of Life, excuse me. So as a 2013 Bush Foundation Fellow, Diane focused on indigenous seed preservation. And I am going to turn my screen over to Diane um, I'll let you guys know quickly before I do that. Diane has 30, up to 30 minutes to present and she'll take questions after that. Okay, Diane, it's all yours. Okay, good morning. Um, it is an honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation and um, the introduction. So I have to, okay, I'm trying to multitask. So let me get my PowerPoint. Okay, all right, so again, my name is Diane Wilson. I'm the executive director of the Health. Um, we are a nonprofit uh, organization with a 10 acre farm in Hugo, Minnesota, and also I'm actually calling in from our office on Franklin Avenue, which is right in the heart of the Phillips neighborhood in, the, in Minneapolis. Um, the Twin Cities are home to a uh, Oh, about 38,000 Native people, so this is a, a significant community um, in terms of uh, the work that we do. So I just wanted to say, um, start by telling you a little bit about how Dream of Wild Health even got started uh, back in the year, let's say, 2000. Um, I heard about this tiny little garden down in Farmington. It was a half acre and they were growing out old seeds. Um, Sally OJ was the executive director at the time for Petawakan Tipi, which was a nonprofit in St. Paul and they were working, they provided transitional housing for Native people in recovery. And it was the clients who asked for a way to get back to the land, to get back to traditional foods and medicines. Except at that time, um, you know, there weren't, there weren't many people growing out these foods or working with the seeds. So <clears throat> Sally had some seeds from her grandmother and they started growing these out um, just as a garden. And when I heard about it as a gardener, as someone who was really struggling to understand how assimilation had impacted my family. Um, I should say that I am Dakota um, and my mother was uh, from Rosebud. And so struggling to understand it, somehow for me, a key in that, in that process were, were those seeds and getting back to the foods. And so I got involved with Dream of Wild Health back when it was just this tiny little garden with a handful of volunteers, a few seeds, and um, I would say a couple of shovels. So it was just, it was people wanting that to rebuild that connection with the land, with our foods, with our seeds, with, our, with each other. And um, from that, Point, then we um, created a program that began growing out these seeds. Um, and there was enough interest and commitment and support for the work that within five years, we bought a farm in Hugo. It's a 10-acre farm 
Um, it's within 30 miles of um, the metropolitan area. And we've, been, we've, we've created a program that is intergenerational, it's intertribal, it is, um, <clears throat> well, this is Ernie Whiteman, who's our cultural director. And I love this image because it shows how we have families coming together at the farm um, to, to relearn um, how to share food together, how to grow it, how to cook it, how to, how to preserve it, and um, how to protect those seeds. So um, this is our mission. I'm sorry. Hey, Diane. Yeah. We actually can't see your presentation. You can't see it? No. Okay. I think you have to hit the share screen button. Okay. Which should be at the bottom in green. I didn't do that. Oh, and here's all this. Okay. All right. Now, now I'll go back to it. Can you see it now? Oh, I think it's going. Is that it? Let's see. No, somebody else just signed on and went to a black screen. Um, I don't know. Can anybody else see it? Share screen. Um, oh, here we go. I got it. I think I skipped a step. How's that? Okay, now That's good. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay. There, how's that? I see, I see heads. This is not it. Okay, this is Dream this Alarm. Is <laughs> These are the kids in our programs. These are youth who actually this, I love this photo because this was, um, these are the, these are garden warriors, and what they're holding are the four medicines. And um, like I was just saying about the early days when we had really a couple of shovels and some seeds down in Farmington, this is taken at the farm in Hugo, and we have managed over the past the what is it, twelve years that we've been there to um, reestablish the four sacred medicines. So they have just finished gathering these medicines. So that, that's why I love that, I love that photo. Um, and this is the, um, the photo when I was talking about the intergenerational aspect of Dream of Wild Health. It's really important for us to bring youth and elders and staff and community all together back on the land. Because the, the, um, as we're re gaining, recovering our relationship with these traditional foods and medicines, what we've learned is that the most important work we're doing is rebuilding that relationship with the land. So this is taken actually at the farm. That's Ernie Whiteman, who's our cultural director, his daughter and his granddaughter. Um, and our mission is to restore health and well-being by recovering knowledge and access to healthy indigenous foods, medicines, and life ways. Um, and so, oops, oh, well, let's see, I'm not sure how to go back. So, uh, oh, let's see. Well, so I skipped over a screen there, and but what that showed was just more of the statistics that really Amber has already indicated. The reasons why we got into this work in the beginning was the fact that um, it was the epidemic level of, of diabetes in our communities and the fact that food is so important to our culture. It's, you know, it's, it's one of the places where we, we um, where our traditions are centered with songs and prayers around seasonal activities. Um, it's re restoring the knowledge that our ancestors held for us about the importance of these foods. Um, and so food is medicine, of course. And, and one of the things that we try with that we teach our youth is the fact that it was, it was our ancestors' efforts 
that made sure that we have these seeds, these foods today um, to, be, uh, to be doing the work of growing them and sharing them and taking care of them for the next seven generations. So, so this, uh, again, are some of the garden warriors in our program and that image in the corner shows um, our ancestors and how we are connected between the generations doing this work. So, the, so out of those early days when the farm really had nothing more than a garden, um, thanks to the effort of our community, the funders who supported us, the families who came, the, um, the youth who participated in our program, then we have been able to build slowly over time an organization that actually had, does um, a, a wide range of work um, between our office and the farm. So we have a Save Seed program, we have an indigenous berry orchard, we have an organic market garden where we, bring, we provide access to healthy indigenous organic foods um, down in the Twin Cities in, in markets that are close to native families. And then we, we have education programs to support this. And I do wanna say that the organization evolved this way as, as a way of meeting each challenge um, that we came up against along the way in, in trying to help families and <coughs> youth re recover that relationship with their food. And so there are issues around access. For example, one of the things we learned was that with our families, um, we have challenges around income. We have challenges with transportation, getting to markets. And then we had a significant challenge around knowledge, um, the knowledge of indigenous foods um, and traditional foods and medicines, how to grow them, how to cook them, the importance of them, and, e and even our history of what the uh, traditional diet looked like and why we didn't have these kind of health disparities before the reservation system was implemented, before commodity foods um, itself laid a foundation for uh, so many of the, um, the preventable diseases that we're struggling with today. So um, uh, at the heart of the work that we do is a collection of old seeds um, that were given to us by Cora Baker, who is a who was a Potawatomi elder and seed keeper. And back in about 2000, or just before that, she heard about Dream of Wild's Health, small garden down in, in Farmington. And this is an, a part of the letter that she wrote to us, that, that um, um, she was in her 90s and she had been gardening all her life in the Wisconsin Dells. She used to grow out uh, her own corn and hang it up in a braid on the outside of her barn and people would come by and see the corn and, and they would visit and then they would share their seeds. And when she was um, in her 90s and getting close to her time, then she was really concerned about what would happen to those seeds because her kids didn't want them. Um, it was too much responsibility. And so when she heard about Dream of Wild Health, then she got in touch with us and gave us her collection of seeds, which was around 200 varieties. And it is, it's a huge responsibility because those were seeds that have been, um, they've come from a lot from the Midwest, but from different areas around the country. So her collection included Cherokee Trail of Tears corn, for example. So we know that we have seeds that were um, carried on the, on the various removals and that our ancestors uh, really made such sacrifices in order to protect those seeds so that we would have them. And when we first got those seeds, um, the, the fear that we had was that we didn't, you know, sometimes we only had a handful of them and we didn't want to be the ones that would lose them because they're so, they were old, they were fragile, and we are now in a world that is, um, been overtaken by by GMO seeds and we are in Hugo we're surrounded by fields of GMO corn so we had to learn how to hand pollinate those seeds in order to protect them so to do that work we got into a partnership with um, the University of Minnesota who came out and helped us learn how to do that work 
So we now have several different gardens. One of them is a traditional garden that grows out in three, the three sisters. So our different varieties of corn, uh, squash, and beans. We've got turtle bean, what were Hopi turtle beans, black turtle beans, and turns out they love Minnesota. Um, we have, oh, we had nine or 10 different varieties of, of corn, but um, Strangely enough, there was no Dakota corn in that collection. So that's one of the, that's one of the uh, varieties that we have um, restored to, um, to the farm. And that for us is really important work because we are on land that is uh, Dakota homeland. And so to be able to grow two varieties of corn is for us a way of um, not only helping to restore that corn to the Dakota communities here in Minnesota, but also just decolonizing the land itself. When we first moved to this 10 acre farm, it had been conventionally um, gardened or farmed for many years with a corn squash or corn soybean rotation, lots of fertilizer, lots of pesticides, and that soil was completely, um, it was completely uh, just stripped of all nutrition. It was exhausted. So that what we've done in the past 12 years is to really rebuild and nurture the health of that soil using organic methods. Um, so we're an organic farm, but we see that from a very, from a traditional way of reciprocity with the land, meaning we're accepting these beautiful gifts of food each season, and what we give back is by feeding the land, by nurturing it with with, by nurturing um, with, corn, with cover crops and compost and making sure that we're always paying attention to our soil. Um, we have a traditional tobacco garden that is maintained by Ernie Whiteman, our cultural director, and the young men. So just this past, this past um, season, we've had young men come from other tobacco uh, programs and get involved and learn um, all about growing, harvesting, drying, and then this is something that we share back with the community so that uh, we don't have to rely on uh, commercial tobacco for prayers. Um, so this is something that if people need seeds, we have a lot of, uh, it's Nicotiana rustica, it's the traditional tobacco. And we also have a women's medicine garden. Um, these tend to be we're trying to, it's actually an area that has um, a fair, we're, we're, we're trying to establish some of the wild plants that have been important as medicines. Um, and we don't have a person currently on staff who does, uh, works with, with medicines um, other than uh, Hope Flanagan, who is actually a, a very accomplished uh, wild, wild food gatherer. So one of the things we did with our corn in our partnership with the university was to actually have a nutrition test done on them. And we compared them to market varieties of food. So the corn, the beans, and the squash. And it, all it did was confirm the reasons why our, what our ancestors knew is that these were exceptional foods. Um, and what has happened to corn in recent years with all of the um, with all of the new hybrids um, and the, the genetically modified um, seed varieties is that we've lost a lot of the nutrition in these corns. And so that some of that sweet corn is more like a donut than it is a real food. And by going back to these old seeds, we are re restoring the very high nutritional level of um, the foods that we're eating. Um, we also thought about the fact that berries have been a significant part of our uh, diets and so and yet there are fewer and fewer places for people in the Twin Cities especially to gather these foods and so we find that our youth often don't know even what they look like, how to forage for them, how to prepare them. Um, and so we, working with Leah Fauché, um, she helped us install a two-acre indigenous berry orchard. These are some of the varieties. Um, everything started as a seedling, and you do really have to guard against deer where we are, so everything had to have a fence. Um, the, uh, the elderberries 
This was the first year we actually have seen fruit starting on our elderberries. Um, our white cedars, most of them survived. Again, that's just like the deer's favorite food. So, um, so that is almost to the point now where we, our goal is to have a place where families can come and forage. They can relearn what these plants look like. Our youth are learning, are growing up, learning how to identify them, what they're used for, how to prepare them for feasts or for ceremony. So that has been um, a, a gratifying project. Um, you know, I did want to mention too, I don't have a photo, of, but two years ago, we also added a pollinator meadow. We had two acres of the farm that are really marginal land um, very sandy and at the time very weedy so we kept it in a cover crop for a number of years and uh, worked really worked to restore the land and then just to, uh, last last season we we installed um, a, a pollinator meadow which is essentially restoring it to prairie and again this is another way of decolonizing that land by bringing back the plants that originally grew here, we find that when we bring those plants back, that what we see is a significant return from our native bees and different bird varieties. Um, the pollinators come back. And so it, it helps us create not just a farm that is um, growing out food for markets or for other programs, but really creating um, a world, a system, an ecosystem that is completely supportive of each other. So in the best possible way, it expresses the Dakota saying, mitakiasi, mitakuye owasi, which is we are all related and believing that the pollinators, the seeds, the, the water, the soil, the birds, the animals, these are all our relatives we are um, making sure that we are taking care of each other. And, and this is a way of ensuring that the farm itself will succeed and um, be, be abundant in its productivity. So the past two years, we have grown out at least five tons of food. So I do believe um, that this is, uh, the system is working. We also have a, an inipi, a sweat lodge, on our property and a women's circle that maintains it. And so to have prayer embedded and ceremony that's embedded at the heart of our organization um, so that um, that, is, that, that is bringing, that's always remembering that um, the spiritual side of our, of our programs is as important as everything else that we do. So, um, the food that we're growing, the vegetables, um, these are not the save seeds, but just every vegetable that you find at a farmer's market, we, we grow out about four acres of, um, of primarily indigenous produce, but we define that very broadly so that um, it is vegetables from the Americas. And we bring that food down to three farmer's markets in the Twin Cities and the idea is to uh, provide access to these healthy foods. And so we have, we, we pick markets that are in areas that are convenient to, to Native families. Um, so Lake Street is one, the Four Sisters right on Franklin Avenue. And that's a, a newer market. It has a lower participation. So in terms of an economic program, they are not, we're not making much money yet, but we're seeing this as a slow, uh, long-term solution where we are both educating families and youth uh, to encourage them to use these foods while providing the access to the market. Uh, we do a lot of donations to food shelves um, at DIW and the Elders Lodge um, and also uh, provide vouchers that with uh, working with programs like the uh, Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center. Uh, so at, another thing that's very important to what we do is uh, our youth programs. So at the farm, we have a saying that we grow seeds and we grow leaders. 
So our youth programs ensure that the work that we're doing in restoring these seeds and um, learning about a, a healthy, balanced indigenous lifestyles is, is being passed on to our youth. Um, and so we have a, a series of programs that teach about seed saving and organic farming, traditional agriculture, and at the same time, give them awareness of what it, of what um, a healthy uh, traditional diet would have looked like and what it means to have a healthy lifestyle that's, that includes uh, exercise that you'd find through gardening. Um, we have other activities like archery. We've gotten our young women involved in Quay Strong, the, the summer triathlon, um, and we also teach them leadership. So our, we have, um, during the summer, we've got two programs. Uh, one is Cora's Kids. Those are eight to 12 year olds, and they come for a week at a time during the day. And then we have the Garden Warriors, and those are the teenagers, 13 to 18, who come for four weeks. Uh, both programs are structured roughly the same where we send a van down to pick the kids up in the city. And so that limits our program to 15 because that's the size of our van, but that's actually a good working size. And then they come up to the farm. They're up at, they're up at the farm by 9 a.m. Usually the teenagers sleep all the way up. And then... Um, uh, once they get there, we start, they have a breakfast snack, and then we start in circle. So we have prayer, we smudge, um, they get a cultural lesson um, from the elders, and then they will have a garden lesson. They work in the fields in the morning. And so we do, we do um, have to be very patient and compassionate on that first, that first week, because the teenagers are coming just with all the all the, um, the choices that teenagers sometimes make. So the first thing we ask them when they get out of the van is you have to leave behind your cell phone, your iPad, your iPod. You have to leave all your electronic gear in the farm, in the van. Um, and that's kind of a shock, the first shock. And then um, in the mid morning, we send a team of them in that, to, um, to make lunch and they will work with uh, our nutrition coordinator to learn basics of nutrition and cooking skills. They're working, they're creating these beautiful healthy lunches from, from vegetables at the farm. We use a lot of um, uh, bison in our food um, whenever possible. And so we expose them to as many indigenous foods as possible. So that first lunch then is the next shock for our teenagers when they are, we are asking them to try all these different foods, uh, all these vegetables. And the first day, I have to admit, some of the kids will not touch the food. All they'll eat maybe is fruit. Um, and so we know it's a big change. So what we do is ask them just to taste it, you know, just to try these things. And then we'll generally see by the end of the program, by the end of that four weeks, is a tremendous shift in their open, openness and willingness to encounter these foods. Um, if they come back, and we have about half our kids come back over multiple seasons, then we see a, a really significant change in them. And we start to see that change ripple out into their families where they will go home and say, you know, I learned today we shouldn't be drinking pop and here's why or I want to make dinner tonight, or, um, you know, I want to eat, Why I want to try kale, things like this. So we know that this is slow work, but we have found that if you are patient with our youth and really encourage them from every direction, learn how to grow your food, learn how to cook it, understand why it's important culturally, um, that that's, they are probably the best advocates we know in terms of making change in the community. We also pay them. So when they come up, they're going to make a stipend every week. And that for these, you know, for kids who are too young or have, who are, have trouble finding work, they're going to make enough money that it'll help them buy school, school clothes, school supplies, 
Um, some of our kids, because they come from inner city, they're also ha helping their families. Um, and then the ones who really succeed in the Garden Warriors program go on to become youth leaders. And youth leaders meet the rest of the year. And they're the ones that we really support as advocates in the community. We take them to conferences where they present. Um, we take them to uh, other programs where they do peer teaching. And they actually created a food policy, an official food policy for Dream of Wild Health, which was approved by the board and that goes out to any group that wants to visit. So we don't allow pop, we don't allow junk food. We encourage, um, you know, a pre-understanding of the work that we're trying to do um, before coming to visit. Um, this is just a photograph from our chorus kids who are by far the, they, that's a great age at which to get kids started with gardening um, and trying new foods. We find them to be uh, much more open than teenagers when they come. Um, and then this is uh, some of our youth leaders who are doing, uh, they are doing a food demo for a kale salad and they've got it, I think that's out at Owamini. So this is a job for them. They are, they are community advocates and um, they become, they also develop very close relationships with each other. So they become a support network for healthy lifestyles um, that that for youth who are not involved in alcohol and drugs. We also have, do outreach to, um, we know it's not always possible for people to come to the farm. So we started, we support a community garden on the east side of St. Paul where native families can come um, and just participate both in the growing and the sharing of the food. Um, we've also done Gardens in a Box, which is for people who have some space, and it's a little three foot by three foot garden that can grow a fair amount of food. Um, and we've done cooking programs. This was a six week program where families received a box of utensils and they learned all the basic, uh, actually this is a canning program. Um, so we do canning programs in addition to basic skills education. Uh, in the fall, we do food preservation and hominy. And this is a quote that I love just because it talks about how important these seeds are to our communities. That it's not just food for us, but these seeds are carrying our stories, they're carrying the legacy of our ancestors. Um, to me, they are they are both, they're both a metaphor and the actual, um, the seeds themselves are, it's a way of, it's a way of bringing that circle whole again um, between what our ancestors knew and grew and how they lived and bringing those, suit, those seeds back and knowing that we're protecting them for the, for the next generations. So um, it's one of the reasons why I really, I really, oh, I, and so this work then led us to become involved with a, um, a group that's now called the Upper Midwest Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. It's for any, any organization, individuals who really want to become involved in helping to preserve and grow out and um, uh, share our seeds. And from that, we are, we're now working at the farm in developing what's called value added products. We want to grow enough corn, for example, to make cornmeal and hominy that we can bring back as food for our community. Um, and this is everybody's favorite job, turning the compost pile. And it's the con my contact information. So if after this, um, after the webinar today, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. We are more than happy to share resources, talk about how we got the programs developed. We will share seeds. Um, so please feel free to get in touch and, and thank you for um, the invitation to be part of this today and for your time and attention. Pidamaya. And now I stop sharing. Thank <laughs>
Um, you can leave it up for a minute okay. so that people okay. can take down your information if they want to. Thank you so okay. much, Diane. The no. work that you're doing is outstanding. Um, we have time. If anyone has questions for Diane, you could either write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and actually talk. I have a question right away for you, Diane. What was your, what has been, or maybe was in the beginning, your biggest challenge? Um, you know, in the beginning, especially the biggest challenge was trying to encourage, uh, how do I say this? The, through the reservation system and the commodity foods, over time, so much knowledge has been displaced that we actually had trouble getting people interested in these foods again. Um, both the our old seed, the foods we were growing out from our old seeds and also the um, healthy vegetables, the organic vegetables that we would bring down to market. So that's when we found that while you really have to do a lot of, you have to do the education piece. You have to talk about the history. You have to talk about um, the seeds, you have to, and then you have to build, rebuild skills around gardening and cooking. And what I've seen in the past 10 years is a, is a big shift um, and a lot of momentum around our communities becoming more interested in, in this work and really coming together to share our knowledge and, um, and understanding how important this is to us as Native people. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Diane? Look at my chat to see. I must have been very thorough. <laughs> I think that you were. <laughs> and I know sometimes it's <clears throat> also hard to figure out this technology because it's new to most people. Yeah. And again, if um, that that's my um, email there. So if you think of something later, please feel free to get in touch. All right, I'm not seeing any questions yet. Everyone's really shy today, I guess. So I'll thank you again, Diane, for presenting. That It was very thorough and I think everyone learned a lot from you. You're making a huge difference, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we will introduce our second speaker. And, oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so David Manuel is a member of the Red Lake Nation and currently employed as the foods coordinator, a pro, um, the foods coordinator of the Red Lake Food Initiative. Well, thank you, Amber. Um, I'll just let you know, Amber, I'm, I'm not at the office at my computer. I'm in the parking lot of the Sanford Hospital in Bemidji. I forgot I, my wife had a doctor's appointment, a consultation. So I, I, I'm out in the car on the cell phone, but I am here. And I will uh, start out by saying uh, it's a real honor to, be, to share the bill with Diane Wilson. Uh, co-director of Dream Wild Health. Um, I, I view their program as being one of the pioneers here in Minnesota of getting this indigenous food movement going. That's that's how I feel about uh, that, you know sharing this bill here with, with Diane Wilson, and it's an uh, honor to be a guest here on this webinar. Thank you for inviting me, Amber. Yes, and I am pulling up your um slideshow now i know it's a series of images do you want me to scroll through it um you can scroll through it yeah and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna talk off the top of my head i don't got a script in front of me i'm sitting in my car in the parking lot so i'm just gonna you know I, and I, I i've done presentations before so i'm just gonna go off the top of my head and say you know back in in 2014, uh, our newly elected chairman decided to have a series of community meetings in, in, in and around the reservation. 
we have four communities in Red Lake. We have Red Lake, we have Red Bee, Little Rock, and Panema. They're, they're uh, all communities between one and two thousand people. And uh, one recurring theme that kept coming up over and over again was people wanted fresh food, people wanted healthy foods, people wanted um, access to that, the, the good foods that uh, their ancestors used to have. And uh, so all this was, was written down, notes were taken, and and one of those in attendance at those meetings was Sherilyn Spears. She works for economic development up in Red Lake, and so she made it a project to hers, and uh, uh, with the help of Sharon James, who is uh, our director, and Sam Strong, who heads up economic development, um, they they did some studies, they did some assessments, and uh, was were able to secure funding and begin our uh, our journey as the Red Lake Local Food Initiative. Um, they partnered with uh, the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux community, Wazupi Gardens, and and uh, received we received a lot of help from them in picking out a high tunnel um, in April of 2016. Just last year, um, we we went operational, and when I mean going operational, I mean that. A coordinator for the program was hired, and an assistant coordinator was hired, and a site was chosen to to have a, a training garden. The, the one of the things that we do um, at the initiative is that we realize that we, you know, we we lost a lot of our agricultural traditions, and uh, I heard uh, Diane talk about that losing that knowledge and, and losing touch with our traditional food ways. Um, well, that's all we're doing. We're starting right there. We're starting from scratch. And, and it involves a whole scope, a whole array of, of things that we're attempting to address. We want to address uh, diet-related health disparities with our food work. We want to address that diet, those diabetes uh, issues, uh, the obesity issue, um, getting out there and exercising. Um, so we, we incorporate a lot of different things into what we're doing. We have an economic component. We, we have uh, a 40% unemployment rate in Red Lake. And here just in, in, in 1900, and I want to say 16, we exported something like 10 tons of potatoes or more to the town of Bemidji and surrounding areas. We, the Red Lake Nation, used to be a agricultural powerhouse at one time. And through, you know, the process of acculturation, assimilation, and the commodity food programs that Diane talked about, um, people stopped planting. People stopped growing food in Red Lake. And, you know, we want we want to return that tradition back back to uh becoming just a, just a something that we do. Second nature, you know, when we get up one spring morning and we decide, hey, it's time to till the garden. It's time to get our plants in. We we want people just to do that automatically because that's how it used to be. All families used to have gardens in Red Lake. Um, all, all through Indian country, no matter what tribe you were from, there was some form of agricultural activities going on and that's what sustained them. That's, what, <clears throat> that's how they thrived. And that's what we that's what we want to go back to. Um, so with you know picking a, a training site for the picking out a site for the garden and and, and kind of finding out what we're gonna do. We you know we we, we built a high tunnel and and uh, 
we started planting um, through our partnership with Wazupi Gardens. And uh, we we were able to, to to get a whole bunch of starter plants, tomatoes, peppers, stevia, um, pumpkin, squash, uh, you name it. Just every every kind of vegetable that we thought we could grow, we got from them, and we stuck them in the ground. And we had a pretty good year last year. Um, our focus is on training tribal members how to grow food and bringing back some of the ancestral foods that uh, we used to eat a lot of them. Um, we, we have our own variety of how many corn. Diane talked about uh, growing different varieties of corn. We have our own variety up in Red Lake that does well in our soils, in our area, in our climate. And it's really closely related to the the Bear Island French corn that people seem to know quite a lot about, especially in Minnesota. Um, I myself have grown the Bear French corn, and I like it. And the Red Lake corn looks a lot like the Bear French variety. So I think they're really closely related. Um, We grew out a bunch, and uh, we hope to grow out more next year. And that we again, just like Diane said, you know, go, you know, taking a look at those value-added products, making that into into how many, you know, de- dehydrating it or, or turning it into a, a cornmeal, um, and using it, you know, in the in the fall and winter months is uh, something we're looking at. Where uh, we partner a lot. Um, in fact, if we hadn't been able to partner with different community organizations and, and tribal programs, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. We'd have been uh, really hamstring sort of. We really believe in this getting out and meeting people and networking and, and uh, sharing responsibilities and, and sharing the rewards and, and in the hard work that we do. Um, another partner that we have is New Beginnings or Oski Machata Da. Oski Machata Da is an Ojibwe word that simply means New Beginnings. And they, uh, they're uh, the job training program for the Red Lake Nation. <clears throat> and uh, they Provide you know people assistance to get their GED, get their driver driver's license, um, safe serve certificates, uh, nursing certificates. Um, you know they're they're, the, they're they're really helpful in in providing those vocational opportunities for for our, our Red Lake tribal members. They also have a, a wonderful welding program too. Um, but we were able to partner with them and get uh, initially eight eight people to uh, learn about agricultural production. And we take them from the beginning of, of uh, tilling up the soil and preparing the soil, making the rolls from... from planting to cultivating, watering, irrigating, putting down drip tape, stuff like that. We we uh take them through that whole season. In fact we're in, we just finishing up here uh yesterday we were washing up the potatoes that we had harvested. We're we're almost done up here in Red Lake. Uh with the help of the high tunnel we're still growing tomatoes. Um, even though it was 37 degrees this morning, our tomatoes are okay and still ripening on the vine as we speak. And I look forward to having one maybe tomorrow or the next day. So we're really, you know, having fun, learning a lot. Um, another partner that we have is our SNAP educators. And uh, that's been really fruitful, and we were able to 
<coughs> provide healthy cooking classes uh, one time a week. We've been, I think we've been doing it for almost uh, 12 weeks now. We plan on, on doing 16 weeks and then taking a break and maybe picking it up again after Christmas or after the holidays. Um, but we, we, you know, again, we'll partner with them and then we'll recruit uh, cooks that know how to cook healthy. Uh, and, you know, they're right on the res. There's all kinds of good cooks, good healthy cooks right on the reservation. And, and they'll throw together a meal and they'll take your, all the attendees to to it and, and then with the SNAP educator there she'll be taught you know, she'll be interjecting with all the nutritional benefits of of eating, uh, you know, whether it's wild game or indigenous food or or just your average generic healthy meal. Um we've been doing that Wednesdays at the tribal government center at our at our uh EMP, the elderly nutrition program. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm getting a little hoarse here. I'm going to take a sip of my coffee. <coughs> um, we partner with the Red Lake Nation College. Um, I I go over there on a on a frequent basis and give talks to students about food sovereignty and um, traditional foods and seasonal activities. Um, we partnered with the, the Red Lake uh, School District, and uh, we have classes come in the garden, and we go into the schools, and we, you know, whatever topic the, the, the teacher has, we, we kind of, we will adapt what we know and and, and and share with the students. We do that quite a lot. Um, in the springtime, which is my favorite time of year, we go out to the sugar bush. Uh, we have a sugar bush. Actually, I've been doing a sugar bush for a number of years, but um, when we started this program, we um, we just brought the program to the sugar bush and. Oddly, that's that's probably our most popular activity throughout the whole year. Every day, people are coming to the sugar bush classrooms and families, and, and uh, people taking time off of work just to come out and hang out at the sugar bush, and they get to experience um, what I call the Anishinaabe New Year, and. Uh, and that's when things are waking up and a new life is returning. The birds are coming back. Uh, geez, you even got flies buzzing around towards the end of the sugar bush. But anyway, it's a real good time of year to, to uh, get things off on a good foot. And uh, that's usually around March and April we do that. <coughs> and then we go straight from there to, uh, you know, planning for their the garden and ordering our seeds and and our starter plants. Um, we did. We do have a greenhouse. Um, we just received it this year um, with our partnership with Red Lake Comprehensive Health. They used the, their ship dollars um, through the Minnesota Health Department uh, and purchased us a. A greenhouse from Farm Tech. Uh, but we have we haven't had time to put it up yet. We we hope to get it up here in the next couple of weeks, where we can begin to produce our own starter plants and become that much more sovereign. Because a lot of this work is based on that concept of food sovereignty. And you know, I was sitting there, I was thinking about this last night. What is food sovereignty? It's something. You know, we talk about a lot, you know, but what it is really is, is just going out and, and creating your own food or hunting your own food or, or buying your own food, but hopefully it comes from a local source. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that, that food sovereignty. 
Um, what it is, is it's, it's really a lot of work. Um, we're, 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 you know, up in our office, you know, we, you know, we have time to just sit down and talk to one another when we're not out doing our, our day-to-day activities. You know, we talk about how do we establish a comprehensive, sustainable food system for the Red Lake Nation. Now, that's a big question, and that's a question I, I mull over at least a few minutes each day because that's our long-term goal. You know, doing doing the cooking classes, yes, right on. Engaging the youth, yes, we have to do that. Um, and all these all these different things that we're doing up in Red Lake are, are important. Um, but the ultimate goal is to reestablish that ability to depend, depend on our own selves, you know, for our food. I, I, I really think that <clears throat> it's a challenge, but it's a worthy challenge, and I think it can be done. We have resources. We've lost a lot of our ancestral land to, to treaties, agreements, colonization. Um you know, yep, yeah, you know, here we are in this moment. We you know, and from this moment forward we you know, we can't trip on you know, what we lost. We need to think about what we can gain from this point on. That's the mind frame and that's the mindset I take. You know I I think, you know, what you know, what what can I do today that I can build on tomorrow? And um you know, doing all those little steps every each and every day. That's how I look at it. Um, you know, uh, if I let it overwhelm me, you know, I become paralyzed. I, I I can't think. I stutter. You know, and I I I I, I get I let fear take over. I can't do that. I uh, I really like this. This. I mean, it's really an honor and a privilege to be given this task. Um, I wish I had more resources at my disposal. That's the, that's the hard part about this work. Is even though we in Indian country we're we're uh, you know we're struggling and the resources are, are so far and few between, it seems like we you know we get missed. But um, I still think it can be done. I, we're, we're getting buffalo. We're getting a, a small herd of buffalo from Wind Cave National uh, Park here this year. I'm really looking forward to us reestablishing a, a little herd of buffalo here in Red Lake. I'm very proud of that. That's something that's coming out of our department, economic development. I also want to mention, too, that you know, we are in the midst of a transition Organizationally, we're transitioning to a CDFI, a Community Development Financial Institution. I believe that's uh, what you call that. And uh, our uh, our new uh, title will be Four Directions Development. So it will still be the Red Lake Local Food Initiative, but it will be a program of that. And uh, I look forward to that. I believe it opens up more doors and financial opportunities for uh, what we're doing. Um, we're really happy to be hosting an annual food conference every year. So, uh, this year we had our, our second annual Red Lake Food Summit. Uh, we had it here in mid-September. And uh, we have four days of uh, learning, um, different tracks going on, like soil and conservation management, uh, seed saving. Um, I heard uh, Diane mention the Indigenous Seed Keeper Network. Um, Red Lake is is a part of that. And uh, we have a couple of people from that network do a a two-day workshop, Rowan White and uh, Zach Page came in and 
did a two-day seed saving workshop here last month uh, at our garden. And it's a real uh, honor to work with those two people. Uh, I know there's a lot of people with a lot of knowledge out there, but the ones I know are Roman and Zach. Do a lot of good work all around the country. We had uh, people come in and do please. We had uh, Martin Reinhardt from Michigan. I should say Professor Martin Reinhardt of Michigan, uh, author of the book Decolonizing the Diet. He came in and, and did a present presentation and keynote and keynote uh, address. It was really good to hook up with, with uh, Martin and, and uh, have him share his knowledge with our other tribal members and, and, and attendees of the conference. <coughs> um, I, uh, there's a, uh, a lot of things that we really enjoy doing. Something we did also this year was uh, we went wild racing, we went and knocked some rice and uh, processed rice. Showed, we were showing tribal members how to how to process the rice so we could eat it, so we could save it for the winter. And, and uh, it's really interesting. And I'll just say this, you know, we, we were, you know, way out in the sticks. We're remote. We're... You know, our reservation is way up in northern Minnesota. And yet, I am always continually amazed by by the amount of of, of uh, our people that that don't partake in racing or tapping maple trees or or hunting or fishing. I'm just amazed by the amount of people that that that. Like totally rely on on grocery stores for their food. Now, don't get me wrong. I go shopping. I go shopping once a week, but I don't totally rely on on uh, the grocery store to feed me. Um, now we just got done processing. My wife and I, uh, we just put aside uh, a little over a hundred pounds of, of wild rice that. Hopefully, we'll get us through the year. And <clears throat> those are the kinds of activities that we really want people to do, to, to think about these traditional foods and how they were vital to our survival and how they made us strong. You know, the, these are the things that our ancestors ate all the time. This is what we're used. This is what our, our physiology is used to. Um, and yet, uh, it's uh, it's a continually a challenge to to uh, and actually it's a good thing you know um, to to be able to share some of the things I know like around rice you know showing people uh, just in the last couple of weeks um, you know how it's done how to process it and we even had um, you know because I'm come I come I'm kind of a rice snob. I got different kinds of wild rice at home, so I was bringing in different kinds of wild rice and showing people well, this. This is this is different from that, and and just showing people the, the variations of how every lake and stream produces a, a different kind of rice. It's all unique, um, whether it's from Leech Lake or Net Lake or 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 White Earth. You know, all these they're the same but different. Um, so I really enjoyed these past few weeks here of racing season here in Minnesota. Uh, um, for those of you that don't know, wild rice is a, is a food that goes out on the water. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful grain, tastes great, um, and it's something that is uh, is kind of embedded into the Anishinaabe culture. Um, so for those of you that aren't from Minnesota or are not Anishinaabe, but just but just understand that wild rice is, is wild rice is to us what the buffalo is to the Lakota kind of a thing. So so know that. Um, 
Uh, something I look forward to here in the winter is showing people how to set snares for rabbits. You can do a little bit of that. Um, um, I want to say that we've only this is only our second year uh, being operational, being in existence. Um, when we're not, you know, working in the garden, we're working on building capacity, you know, um, looking for those resources, <clears throat> looking for that partnership that will help us bring the message of, 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 of eating healthy and living good to our tribal members. Uh, we we uh, really are looking for those partnerships that will that will make us a stronger program that will provide that opportunity to, 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 to for our tribal members to have that uh, access to healthy foods. You know, whether they grow it, you know, in a little garden, you know, in a yard or if they participate in a community garden or or take part in a in a CSA. Um Whatever it takes, uh, our challenges are big, um, and uh, one of the biggest things we, one of our biggest challenges, is getting people interested. Like Diane, what Diane was saying is, you know, with each passing generation, where we've been disconnected from our traditional food. And, and we've adapted to that that uh, grocery store, you know, is, is where we go get our food. You know, er, uh, you know, every generation uh, we become more disconnected. It, it requires that much more effort to 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 uh, reengage. Because um, we'll be sitting there, we'll be talking with kids and their parents. And the kids are open-minded, and they'll try anything once. And hopefully they like these new traditional foods. But it's the parents that, that are the ones that are kind of apprehensive and unsure on whether or not to, to even include a squash in, in a meal. Um, you know, squash is... It's a traditional food, but I mean, it's not that, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know how to put this, but it's like, you know, you know, we should eat more, we should eat more squash, not just at Thanksgiving, you know, or Easter or Christmas, you know, uh, squash could be, you know, eaten, you know, every other day till they're gone after you harvest them. <laughs> That's how I see it. Um. Really, uh, I just the reason I'm talking about squash because I just had a squash the other day, <laughs> and uh, I, I I love squash. I grow squash, um, and uh, I'm a big I'm a uh, uh, I'm a big uh, squash guy. I should be a squash salesman, but uh, I just I just want people to start you know trying things. You know, it's uh, you know, I, I've I've done some reading and they talk about how our our tastes, our 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 are kind of formulated in infancy. You know, and if we're fed chips and pop in infancy, you know, that's what we're going to be going back to as adults, and and these are the kinds of things that. That uh, or kind of the, the challenges that that, that that we have, and and uh, getting people to attend, uh, especially the uh, uh, we've had to really do. We really had to focus on on um, on how we market things, and uh, to get people to attend our trainings. But we we began to develop like a core group of, of people and their families that keep coming back on a, on a, on a repeated basis now. Um, we're starting to see some uh, 
I don't want to say recidivism, but uh, you know, people coming back <laughs> to our to our, our you know, when we get, we jump into that second and third cycle of uh, uh, rotating things around and, and doing like the canning, preservation, or the berry picking, or or uh, canning foods, we, we're starting to see people come back now as we got into our second year, we're, and we hopefully next year, you know, if we you know, keep doing it, be persistent. Um, like I say, marketing has been our biggest challenge, getting the word out. You know, I've been, I've been, I don't know how many times I've been told, oh, I didn't hear about that, you know. So we're really working on getting, getting that word out. We use social media. We have a Facebook page. Um, you can check out our Facebook page. Um, it's simply the Red Lake Local Food Initiative, and uh, I try to update it uh, as much as I can. Um, if you look on it now, you'll see that yesterday we were we were washing potatoes. We were washing a uh, newly harvested Yukon Gold and Mountain Leds. Um, a couple of days before that, we were washing our carrots. Um, so that's a real, you know, we find that that Facebook page is, is a real good, uh, way of touching base with, with people. Um, granted everyone, you know, doesn't have Facebook, but it is an important tool of communication and marketing that we have. It's one of the most important. Um, we also use the, you know, our, our, uh, our email contacts, and uh, we have a website uh, for directionsdevelopment.com. You can check us out there. That's for directionsdevelopment.com. Um, and uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, I'm uh, I'm running out of gas here. Some, I have one question uh, that one of the guests uh, sent in chat, and he said, David mentioned that food security is a lot of work. What, what does David recommend others do to get people to get on board and help with this important work? Well, <clears throat> I think we lead by example, and even the smallest example, like, Having a garden is important, you know. Uh, doing what you say is very important. Um, um, but, you know, like for us, um, we have access to, uh, I don't know, about 100 acres of land, um, but no way to develop it, you know. So what we really need is, is uh, we need a tractor. We need implements. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that we need to to develop that that food system for the Red Lake Nation. Um, next year we're gonna do we're gonna get into some chickens. Uh, start with the laying hens first, and and see where that takes us. And because we you know we need to start supplying our own you know protein sources too. Um, we do have the Great Red Lake fishery, which provides uh, lots of healthy freshwater fish, uh, a great source of protein for the members of Red Lake, uh, but not everyone has a boat and is able to get out there on the lake, so there, there are some barriers, even to Red Lakers, to get fish from the lake, you know, there's not many places where you can fish right up the shore, so, you know, you know, not everyone was taught how to, to make a snare to go get a rabbit in the winter, which is a good source of lean meat. Um, but just all the, all those things, you know, together, um, you know, share share my message, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, plant a garden. Take your, your, your child, your grandchild out to that garden and, and uh, have a good have a good time out there with them, and 
and uh, so that's what I've done. That's what I that's what I do, and that's I think that's what, that's just the best way to get to. to you got to live it. You really got to live it. I mean, you don't have to be, you know, super outdoorsy or a great hunter or a great fisherman, but you need to do it in some way, shape, or form. Thank you, David. We have another question for you. Okay. And that is, how, how does David get the public willing to pay for the harvested food, or do they pay for it? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> um, we actually have sold food um, at our farmer's markets. We had a total of four farmers, farmer's markets this year. We had them right in front of our tribal uh, council building, and, and people were more than happy to pay for our fresh produce. Um, we, uh, we also sell vegetables to our casino. And what I did is I brought over a, a big sampling of our vegetables here to them earlier in the year. And I showed them to their, uh, their, uh, to the restaurant, uh, the head of the restaurant there in Red Lake. And, and they fell in love with our vegetables. And so they've been ordering vegetables from us for uh, use in their kitchen at the Warrior Grill in Red Lake, and we've also sold vegetables to the Harmony Natural Foods Co-op in Bemidji. Um, that was, uh, I really feel, felt like we passed the test when we were able to, to market and sell our vegetables to the highest quality grocery store in Bemidji. That's, that's, that's where you get all the organic stuff. Oh, I, I want to do. I want to say also that all our food is grown organically, and uh, how we uh, fertilize our our fields is through the ground fish waste created by our fishery. Um, they'll net. They'll they'll go out there and they'll net the fish. They'll take all the fillets and then they'll take the the remaining, grind it up, and then we'll spread it on our field here in the fall and fill it in, and. Uh, I don't know if that PowerPoint, like I said, I'm, I don't, I'm not on a computer, but I think uh, I included in that PowerPoint a picture of our of our trellised tomatoes. Um, I think I did anyway. And, uh, I mean, some of our, our tomato plants are like eight feet tall trellised. I mean, that those, those, those fish cuts are just like, uh, I don't know, plant vitamins, I guess. <laughs> Um, so there, that's, that's all I have to say about that. It sounds like you guys have a lot of really great partnerships where you're both beneficial, uh, or it's mutually beneficial. We have two more questions for sure. And more if people want to chat or speak up. Um, David, I saw in the slideshow, one of the pictures had someone harvesting some ribs, maybe some, <laughs> maybe venison or something. Um, can you talk more? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was a picture taken at our food summit. <clears throat> and uh, we uh, went and harvested a few deer prior to the summit and uh, kept them on ice. And then uh, uh, that was uh, September the 16th, Saturday, out at the food summit, out, outside at the polo grounds. And it was just there, you know, the guy was just showing people how to how to take the deer off the how to, how to take the venison off the meat and I think they uh I think they might have grilled that up later on or included it in, in, in some some meal provided that day. That was uh the last day of food summer is um is just like uh it's 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 just about eating and the chefs and the different cooks. You know, we must have ten ten different stoves going at once. People are frying fish. People are smoking fish and venison. People are making harmony. Um, uh, so many different things going on on the last day of the summit. It's just all about eating until you're stuffed. And at about 3 o'clock, you know, I mean, we were all just like comatose, 
you know, for being all day. I mean, it's, I hate to say that, but that's kind of how we do things in Red Lake. We overdo it. And, uh, uh, but we look forward to that, that final day of the summit next year. And we'll do it all over again. You're making us all hungry, David. <laughs> um, I have one more question for sure. Uh, regarding the uh, farmers markets and how you price your food, how do you figure out how to how to do your pricing to make it competitive for the area? That's a good question. <laughs> we uh, first we tried to go to some database, you know, some scientific stuff, and we blew that off, and we realized there's just too much hassle. And we just did an informal survey of some of the prices around the region at different stores, and then and then we. Uh, you know, we looked at uh, the fact that ours was organic, and uh, and uh, we still we we I think we were still pretty competitive on our prices though. Um, uh, we, but we 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 I think we just you know we just used that that average, you know, that local average by by uh, doing a survey of local stores and just trying to be competitive with them. Okay. Hi, David. This is Donna Shosa at ACAF. I was wondering, um, I know you briefly mentioned the small buffalo herd that you'll possibly be getting. Can you talk more about that? I, I can tell you what I know, um, that they've been building, a, a, that they, they selected a grazing you know, different grazing areas for them and that they've been building a fence um, for them. And uh, I, I've been doing actually a little research on, uh, on on what kind of foods they eat and what kind of grasses that we can plant. Um, and, uh, you know, it's actually a kind of a challenge. Um, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that... Uh, and it's required to, to even have a small herd of, you know, or cattle for that matter. And I'm not, I'm not a rancher, um, but I, I certainly have a lot more respect for those people since I started researching, um, you know, these ranch activities. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, they got it down to a science and, uh, and it's all about keeping, keeping uh, the livestock healthy and strong and them having a good free range life until you eat them. Is that something like a partnership that you would work out with one of the Dakota communities down here or? You know, I, I'm really not sure it was Sam Strong, uh, director of economic development that, uh, that coordinated that. I've just kind of been on the periphery and then done, done a little research for the project, but I, uh, uh, you know, I just know about it, you know, as being on the kind of, you know, the edge of everything going on. It's someone else's project, though. But uh, I'm sure I'll get a piece of that buffalo when they, when, <laughs> next year, maybe. Um, and I, I want to get more involved, too, so maybe, uh, you know, if you stay, you know, maybe if you, I don't know if you're on Facebook, but um, as more information comes along, I'll be posting it to the the Food Initiative uh, Facebook page. Thank you. Perfect. You're welcome. Okay, it doesn't, I'm not seeing any more questions for now and we are a little bit over 1130. I want to um, quickly let everyone, well, first of all, thank you so much, David, especially since you're multitasking, um, helping your wife with her appointment and calling us from the parking lot of the hospital. It's very much appreciated. You did a wonderful job. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Amber. I was for my first webinar. Oh, good job. And you did it from a phone. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Be yeah. good. Um, I want to quickly share that there is a potential food funding, or there is a food funding, food funding opportunity I sent a link to it, the, or sent the web link in the chat, and I have it posted here on this slide. 
Oh shoot, can you guys see my screen? I think you can, right? Yeah, okay. Um, and then I'm not gonna go over our resources in depth, but we have several food resources that are tailored to native communities um, that are all available on our website for download. If you have more questions, please feel free to ask. And if you could take the time to uh, participate in the evaluation survey, that'd be very helpful for us and for the speakers for future presentations. And thank you all so much for participating. And then here's uh, our ACAF website and then my contact information if you don't have it. So thank you again and have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Amber. Mm -hmm.